This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pauline Shukmakchen, your host for Outside In. Last month, there was quite a bit of excitement here in Hawaii, all because somebody pressed the wrong button. But frankly, my guests and I don't understand what all the drama was about. Joining me to discuss this nonsensical non-event is Ralph Casa, president of PAC Forum. Good afternoon, Ralph. Good afternoon, Pauline. <laughs> We're going to have a little bit of a light hundred conversation today about uh, what happened on January 13th. And just, because, just before I ask what you were doing sure. uh, that morning, I'm going to tell you what I was doing. So a lot of my guests on ThinkTech are aware that I don't really use mobile devices too much, um, usually just when I'm driving in the car in California. So uh, at around 8 o'clock, I'm usually having a cup of tea on the lanai. And from where I am here in Hawaii, I have a beautiful view of uh, Fort DeRussi. You see the greenery and you see the lovely ocean from my vantage point. So I was actually completely oblivious to what was going on until about an hour later when I walked back in and uh, pour myself another cup of tea and turn on the television just to see what was going on. And I found out what happened. And then I said, oh, well, that's Hawaii. That's typical. Uh, so that was my reaction. It wasn't such a dramatic reaction as we saw from people being yeah. interviewed on the street. So what were you doing that morning? And what was your reaction to it? Well, I was on a plane uh, <laughs> flying from Switzerland <laughs> to LA on my way back home from a conference. And uh, by the time I landed, it was essentially all over. Uh, but when I heard uh, that there had been this alert, my first reaction was that it must have been a hack or, mm -hmm. or a prank uh, because I was pretty confident that North Koreans, even during a period of tension, wouldn't be launching a missile at us. And right now, where they were in the, their diplomatic truce for the Olympics, uh, it was even less likely. And I was particularly struck. Oh, wh one of the gentlemen who uh, makes videos for us, Tim Apicella, he went out into the street and did several long segments about people's reactions in Hawaii. And um, most of them were fear-oriented, because it's always fear first, and then the anger sets in. Yeah. But mm. I didn't experience either of those two emotions because I'm used to traveling quite a lot and I've stayed in, visited and lived on several islands. And island communities operate differently from continental communities. It's a lower market. And that's not a judgment on my part, it's just true and every single well-traveled individual knows that. So um, I think there are two factors at play here. Uh, th there is um, the, the lack of understanding that a lot of mistakes, a lot of things like this happen on small islands. Uh, this isn't a small incident, this is quite serious, but, uh, and I'm not dismissing it, but it's typical. That's all I'm uh, trying to get across in terms of my reaction. And the other factor is a lack of awareness of the cap true capabilities of North Korea regardless of what is put on the television because I think sometimes the new news broadcasts it kind of feed that fear and get, yeah. promote that fear and, and bend the anger into the public. And really there's nothing much going on. So I read uh, your comment in the Star Advertiser that you stated that there's a less than 1% chance of Hawaii actually being a target for the North Koreans. So is that conclusion that you've come to based on their true capability, your knowledge of their true capabilities? Yeah, I mean, uh, an attack, uh, when you assess the likelihood of an attack, you look at capabilities and you look at intentions. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have the capabilities, then it doesn't matter what your intentions are. You can have the worst intentions in the world and all that's gonna do is cause you to be a grumpy person. Mm -hmm. But if you have the capabilities, then you have to assess whether the intentions are there. Uh, the North Koreans, in my view, don't yet have the capability uh, to put a nuclear warhead on a missile, fire it thousands of miles away, re-enter the atmosphere without burning up and actually hit a target. The day they have that capability, they're still very unlikely to use it because it would be suicidal and they're not crazy. So I sort of combine those two together to come up with my significantly less than 1% chance <laughs> that uh, Yes, it, it is happen. significantly yeah. less than 1%. So, um, I mean, nonetheless, <laughs> though, if, if you, you know, look at your thing and it says, this is not a drill, there's a missile coming, it, it's got to get your attention. I know yes. I 
talk to my wife who was out jogging at the time and, and she got that and she said this this must be a mistake because she remembered what I had told yes. her and actually believed it, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> but still said, but I better head home just to see what's going on. Yes. Uh, so you, you, know, you have to have a little bit of trepidation. Uh, but you know, the, the, less, the less aware you are of those kind of facts and the more you buy into the hysteria that you know, Trump's going to start a war, uh, Kim's <laughs> going to start a war, he's crazy, no, he's crazy, no, which one is more crazy than the other? The more you buy into that narrative, then the more you worry that something like this uh, is more than 1% chance. Yeah. See, I think the real people who are crazy is the media. Um, because I, they're adding this drama to something that doesn't exist. And that's what makes people anxious. Uh, because I, I was watching the reports uh, when the, the actual alert was canceled and everything was fine. And I was hearing about all sorts of strange things that people did, like um, they filled up the bathtub with water so they have sufficient water. That's yeah. pretty logical. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, one person put his whole family in the bathtub, so I don't really understand how that would help. And then people were sort of giggling and laughing at what happened to me because I was completely oblivious to it. And uh, this is because I, don't, I didn't see the cell, cell phone yeah. alert. And they were laughing. They said, oh, well, all you're going to see from your lanai is a mushroom cloud. And I said, well, that's kind of the ideal scenario if it was true. Yeah. Because you just want to see the flash of light and go. You don't want to be hanging around for the yeah. aftermath. Because then you have to worry about toilet paper and cannibalism yeah. and things like that. So, um, I noticed among the people sort of more in the know, they've been trained in these sorts of alerts, uh, military people, yeah. they seem to be rather less flustered by it and more calm. And there is this calm to a military individual because they, their mind is prepared for these sorts of incidents. And I know talking to such persons that they have everything mapped out in their mind. They know exactly what they're, they're going to do very logically. They just said, I'm going to get in the car. I'm going to find out where the missile is headed. I'm going to go to the target, and I just want to see a flash of light. And that's it. <laughs> because they know it's much worse if you hang around afterwards. <laughs> well, actually, I mean, that's sort of silly, quite frankly, because the, the reality is, unless you're very close proximity to ground zero, uh, your chances of survival are pretty high. Hmm. Uh, so if it were to hit, say, Pearl Harbor and you're in Hawaii Kai, uh, you're going to just hear a lot of noise, but you're, you're not going to be an immediate casualty. You want to close your doors and, and everything else. The last thing you want to do is sort of rush to it to see. This is like the crazy people, in, in my view, here in Hawaii, who when there's a tsunami warning, rush to the beach so that they can watch the waves and say, you know. Yeah, that's not the best know, thing to that, do. That, that's only if you're really convinced it really isn't a tsunami warning, so there's nothing to rush yeah. to the beach to see. But if, if there is one, I'm comfortable that I live on the fourth floor and I can look out my window and watch the ocean, but uh, I'm not too worried about uh, running to the beach. Yeah, so uh, at the time when this was supposedly all happening, I was looking outside. There was nothing remarkable about that day for me. It was just as beautiful as every morning. I have my cup of tea and it was just as pretty. Yeah. There was no screaming. I didn't hear people panicking in the building I am in. Yeah. So I think most people just slept in. And then there's these Yeah, few, I think a lot know. of people slept through it. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people didn't believe it or they assumed that this was just a hack or something. Yeah. Keep in mind that while people got their email alert, uh, that only works if you happen to have your iPhone with you and, you're, right. and you're reading it. Uh, what's supposed to happen is that the sirens are supposed to go off warning you of mm. an attack. The sirens didn't go off. Mm. So if you, a normal person, A, didn't hear the sirens, didn't worry, or read this, then saw that there were no sirens and assumed that this must not be right. So I, I think there were more people panicking who were tourists Yes. Or, you know, in, in a, you know, if you get a million people, there's got to be a couple of people who are panicking and they're the ones that are going to get the, uh, the press attention. And, and if you just said it's no big thing or I was having tea and missed it, uh, you're not going to make it on the evening news. <laughs> but more tea, anybody? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I noticed some people that they came to this realization because some of the reactions were, uh, oh, my gosh, I'm going to die. And I said, yeah. well, yes, we all are one day. <laughs> So, but um, uh, this business about the, the media the, and what's driving the panic even more and pe making people worried unnecessarily, 
Uh, it reminds me of the film Being There with uh, Peter Sellers right. and Shirley MacLaine. Chance the Gardener. Yeah, that's right. Chance yeah. the Gardener. So uh, for anybody who hasn't seen this film, I recommend you see it. It's, um, it's a little bit quirky. It's highly yeah. entertaining. It's a bit esoteric. Uh, but I think it brings home a very important point where the, the lead character, his name is Chance, Chance the Gardener. And he was the gardener for a very wealthy gentleman on the estate. And uh, he's lived, he's never come out of the estate. He's never left the grounds of the property. And his whole conception of the world is what he gets from the television. Yeah. <laughs> so this reminds me of that film. Because if you knew better, if, if you knew certain things, uh, like, for example, I went to an entire conference on North Korea. It was about a decade ago, but I don't think much has changed where we were discussing the actual capability and they were telling us from the people on the inside who've been on the ground there and who have certain connections um, that they carry plutonium rods on oxen. So it's not that advanced and every time a missile does go up it just lands in the Japan Sea. So um, I, I don't uh, see what the real threat is as you say. Yeah, I mean I, I think that one of, one of the problems is that if you're an intelligence officer and you're assessing North Korea capabilities you're going to assess the worst case uh, because you have to prepare for the worst case. So worst case, they're capable of doing that today. Next to the worst case is they can do it next Tuesday and the realistic case is that they're still six months away or something like that or six years away. We don't know. Uh, it would be wrong though to underestimate the North Koreans because yes. every time we've underestimated them, they've done some pretty remarkable things. Uh, they've had six nuclear tests now, they've had long-range ICBM tests, they've actually had a submarine-launched ICBM test. So they're, they're mastering the technology, they're getting there. Mm -hmm. uh, whether they can strike Hawaii today, I don't believe so, but certainly they're much closer today than they were 10 years ago. So you can't dismiss the threat, I think you just have to put it in perspective, but then you have to look at the intent as well as the capabilities. when you assess how worried you should be or not be. Okay, so the North Koreans are getting there and we're being there. So we're just going to take a very quick <laughs> break and we'll come back to discuss the button, button, button pusher. Yeah. Yes, our famous button pusher. Good. We'll be right back after this quick break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. Everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome back to Outside In, everyone. We're discussing the button pusher now. So let's talk about this poor chap who's yeah. <laughs> at the end of quite a lot of abuse. Uh, so uh, there are all sorts of strange little facets to what's going on. We're getting bits and pieces here and there every day about <clears throat> what actually happened on the day. My suspicion is we're not going to know the full story until a larger amount of time has passed. Or ever. Uh, or ever, yeah. yes. Well, you have, de isn't yeah. it 30 years for declassified? Yeah. Isn't it? So we have to wait 30 years yeah. <laughs> to find out what actually happened, like with the JFK assassination. Yeah. Like, so um, the story we have so far, are these kind of strange elements at play. And one of the peculiarities I've picked up is this business about David Ige, Governor Ige couldn't, he couldn't locate the password for his Twitter and that's why he couldn't cancel the yeah. alert, which I find strange because, uh, I mean, I'm not in the executive branch of government here, but my understanding with diplomatic uh, heads, uh, ambassadors, the staff are in charge of those sorts of things, not the actual chief yeah. person themselves. So I, things like that don't really make any sense to me personally. Uh, what do you think is going on here? 
Well, I, first of all, I think there is enough blame to go around yeah. and that we can find lots of people to blame. I mean, the, the most important thing is that whoever is responsible for pushing that button, if you will, uh, should have had a second button which yeah. said disregard the first button uh, and he should have pushed it rather quickly. I think the thing with the governor, he wanted to send something out or tweet something or put something out on his Facebook page or something, mm -hmm. which would only be useful if you followed the governor. Yeah. Uh, so that would maybe tell a couple of people. But what you have to do is make sure that the same people who got the first alert <coughs> get the cancellation, and that has to come through the same vehicle. Uh, and the fact that there was apparently no way to do that, as far as we know, uh, is sort of inexcusable to me. I mean, yeah. this is this is basic early warning 101. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is, you're right, it, it is inexcusable objectively on the facts. However, people do make mistakes. This is a human being. A, a robot could probably make a similar mistake yeah. if the robot is hacked. Uh, so my concern, I'm just trying to explain the emotional reaction. Yeah. I didn't have an emotional reaction to this because I just said, oh, that's typical of Hawaii. Because I'm used to uh, New York, London, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore. These places, they they're work like machines. These are big cities full of the creme de la creme, the highly skilled people working. Uh, and if you, the, the system deployed in these kinds of environments is if this idiot doesn't do their job properly, you just fire them and bring in the next idiot. The problem with an island is that pretty soon you run out of idiots. So um, this is one of the issues here. You, people just have to be aware whether they're tourists or uh, living on the island just temporarily, or in fact, if they live here all year round, those people already are aware, are aware of this, mm -hmm. that it's just a lower market, um, regardless of the ethnicity of the people living on the island, has nothing to do with that. It could be an island in Europe, it can be an island in the Asia Pacific, anywhere. Just small island communities operate a few notches lower than you know, large city professionals. That's the standard is generally higher. Uh, Don't you think? I mean, I. First of all, I think there are a lot of smart people on this island yes. also. So yes. it's just a matter of having the smart person in the right job. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, uh, it's in this case, I think it was a system failure more than it was an individual f failure. People can screw up, but once they recognize their mistake, they need to have a vehicle for correcting it. Mm. And that seemed to be the problem. I think they understood pretty quickly that it was a mistake. Uh, but what they didn't know how to do was to let everyone know immediately that it was a mistake. and that. That's a systemic failure, I, don't, I think, more than an individual failure. Uh, and, you know, I used, I've lived in big cities. I grew up in New York. I was a mm -hmm. social worker in Harlem in, in the day. Uh, believe me, big cities can screw up <laughs> just, as, just yes. as easily as, as, as small cities do. In fact, uh, there's a lot more people involved. That means there's a lot more opportunities to, oh, yes, yeah. to screw up. So I'm, I'm not sure I would buy into your, your thesis that it's just because Hawaii is full of dumb people. <laughs> Small <laughs> islands don't have a, a deep bench. No, we, uh, we, we do have highly intelligent yeah, people. Yeah. It's just, it's a numbers game. Yeah. Uh, the, the population is smaller. Things operate differently on an island. It's yeah. based on relationships. So uh, somebody's idiot son or idiot cousin or yeah. idiot so-and-so has to get a job and that's how they get the job. It's yeah. not necessarily I mean, skills-based. Yeah, I, I, I have A, no idea who the individual is. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no idea what his qualifications were or his training was. Mm -hmm. So it, it's hard to make that kind of a judgment, sure. to me at least. But uh, just to be I fair, know yeah. In, important jobs normally have good people in them. And yes. I know personally Vern Miyagi. I've known Vern for many years, mm -hmm. and, and he's a smart guy. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't, you know, I wouldn't say it was he was incompetent, but obviously there were systemic failures that uh, he didn't catch, and he took responsibility for it and, and resigned. Yeah, just to be fair to the button pusher. Um, I was shocked at the number of death threats that he, yeah, he got death threats. That's yeah, that's not that's yeah. not appropriate. Yeah. Um, that that doesn't help. The yeah. incident is now over. Um, there was an error, uh, so it's finished. So there's nothing we can go to go back in time to to repair that. So I'm really shocked at the the abuse he got yeah. um, because one of the things that sep this is something we talk about more in my other show. We like the one percent. But what one of the things that separates a good executive or a good CEO. Um, and one that is more respected generally is you don't yell at employees who've done something wrong. Um, it's, I think, appropriate to become irate 
if the person has some capacity for improvement. I only get angry at employees or colleagues when I think they could have done better, yeah. when there was a scenario that they could have done better and they didn't do the best they could. That's when anger triggers a, a person, is triggered in a person. Um, if you th if a situation is hopeless, whether that's the actual individual or a particular scenario, it is not fair to continue this and uh, sort of yeah. abuse the, the person because he's gotten enough yeah. abuse. So no, he's, I, he's I already feel, embarrassed himself. I feel himself. sorry for the guy, yeah. I mean, quite frankly. And, yeah. Uh, so um, but again, this is the, the bad side of human nature. Where, yes. you know, you, if you're frustrated, you want to blame someone. So he's. Is the I guess the easy easy target the free kick? Yeah, so it, it's an easy target because people are you do things like that when you're scared and confused. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is the this is an unfortunate thing, but I think they've calmed down a bit now that he's stepped down from his position. Is that yeah. correct? Um, yeah, so I mean I I think now cooler heads are starting to prevail. I mean the one thing that I've learned through life is that the first. The first version of any story is likely to be false, mm -hmm. not because someone's trying to deceive you, but the fog of war, as the, the military would call it. There's a lot of confusion going on. Everyone's trying to sort it out. They're trying to solve the problem, and people are asking them a hundred questions, and they say, "Well, I think this," and that becomes the first, the first story. So uh, the first story is almost always wrong. Uh, it seems to me it's taking a long time to get to the second, third, and fourth story. Uh, and uh, and the other thing that we used to learn was that bad news does not get better with age. Mm. Uh, so if uh, if there are additional screw ups there, the sooner people get them out there and then start dealing with them, the better off we are as a society. But people have a habit of you know not wanting to get bad news out there too too quickly. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm uh, sure the governor wishes he had never <laughs> talked about not being able to find his password, for instance, which uh, in the greater scheme of things probably wasn't really relevant in the first place. Well, make, but, you but don't certainly even, didn't make him look like a great uh, Ralph, one doesn't even know if that was his idea. It could yeah. have been his PR team. I, I don't think he's yeah. like that by nature himself. Yeah. He's a very quiet yeah. Uh, nice person. So um, you don't know where these ideas come from yeah. sometimes. And we have to be patient. It, it, all, always Hawaiians say outsiders have to be patient with them, yeah. but we have to be patient with Hawaiians as well. Yeah. And that's why Hawaii is the only U.S. state to have two saints, because you need the patience of two saints here. <laughs> Maybe that's it. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I guess I Father Damien and Sister Marianne. Yeah. Yes, our, we need the patience of yeah. two saints. So um, moving on, Ralph, uh, just one more thing about the media, and we yeah. won't really know what's going to go. So I, I would encourage people not to watch news porn over this subject because you're going to get half-truths, you're going to get embellishments. and. It's kind of an, with the media, it's interesting because it's an out of sight, out of mind thing. Remember when the Malaysian Airlines flight crashed yeah. and uh, they or were talking disappeared. about, yeah. disappeared. Yeah. Um, some people say the, they saw it land on an island somewhere yeah. or whatever. We get the, it was going on and on and people were discussing it left and right for a long period of time. Until I noticed that when these experts started talking about how the engines on the plane were Rolls-Royce engines and how each Rolls-Royce engine has a tracker, then for some reason the story went out of the, <laughs> the scope. No, yeah. Nobody seems to talk about it yeah. really that much anymore. So it, it's always the case with these sorts of things and I would encourage people not to be in a panic so much. Don't let fear consume you over it, anything. Be aware of it, but don't let it overtake you. Um, things like this probably will happen in future, not necessarily in Hawaii, but it could yeah, be elsewhere. No, I, I think so. But, I, you know, yeah. I also think the press has a role to play. Yes. Uh, I've been reading the, the continuing mm. uh, drama here, and uh, for the most part, I think they've been trying to do a decent job of figuring out just what happened. Mm. Uh, and the emphasis needs to be on how do we make sure this doesn't happen again. Uh, and I think the press has a role to play in that, and uh, my sense uh, is that our local uh, folks here have been doing a decent yes. job of trying yeah. to cover it and be objective as to as to what happened. Yes, and hopefully we'll find out the truth uh, further down along the yeah. line in a few years' time or longer. So, uh, in the 
few remaining minutes we have, Ralph, I just want to talk about your work at PAC Forum. Sure. So uh, what is PAC Forum about? I know you've been a guest on Think Tech before, yeah. um, but for those viewers who are tuning in to this particular show yeah. who have never heard of PAC Forum, tell them a little bit about your work there. Yeah, we're a foreign policy think tank. Uh, we've been here for 43 years now, uh, founded by a retired admiral named Joe Vasey who's 101 years old oh. and still as sharp as can be, is still writing articles, and et cetera. Uh, so uh, I, Joe wanted to find a better way of solving problems other than people dropping bombs on one another. And yeah. that's what we've been doing. So we, we hold regular dialogues with the North Koreans. We're one of the few organizations that actually talk with them and they talk back. And you go and, to North Korea and, uh, don't yourself. I've, I've yeah. met North Koreans in other places. Mm -hmm. uh, I've met okay. with them in Switzerland and Chiang Mai okay. recently. And, uh, and in other places. Uh, and we have dialogues with the Chinese and the Taiwanese. We have, you know, U.S. and Russia, South Korea, uh, working a lot on U.S.-China relations and trying to, you know, things like the nuclear posture review and how do we square that circle and, and stay on track. But it's all, I, I joke, we have sort of an overactive Mother Teresa gene. You know, <laughs> okay. we're, we're trying to, <laughs> Lots try of saints. to make the world a, a better place. And, you, know, and, you need uh, many saints here. Yeah. So, uh, and you've got your big annual fundraiser coming up our, in March. So annual, tell people about uh, that if they want to attend. Yes, yes. Ab absolutely. Uh, go to www.pacforum.org and you can get information on it. Uh, this year we'll feature a conversation with Rich Armitage, mm -hmm. the former yeah. Deputy Secretary of State, a very outspoken individual. Uh, he was deputy under Colin Powell, uh, had been assistant secretary of defense prior to that. Very knowledgeable, very outspoken, and we'll do a conversation like you and I are having, but on a stage in front of three or four hundred people. And uh, all of the money will go toward helping our fellowships and helping us survive and continue to find a better way. So ap apart from your annual big do yeah. that you have in March normally, yeah. uh, people can become members of Ab PAC Forum, absolutely. right? So what happens during the normal cycle of events, the schedule of events? What kind of speakers do you get at PAC Forum? Well, we bring in a variety of speakers. We start off each year with a year that was and will be, where we, in, from our internal staff, we will sort of talk about what's happened in the last year and where things are going. And then we bring in uh, guest speakers from time to time. We've had the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff here. We've had the former ambassador from Korea. Uh, we've had, uh, I think, Later this week, actually, we're doing one of our fellows who's just written a book comparing uh, Myanmar with North Korea and how both of them were sort of pariah societies and one came out of the cold and the other still stays in the dark. Exactly. Uh, and we'll have a session on that. And these are breakfast meetings and mm -hmm. uh, people are welcome to come in and uh, they're all off the record, but uh, to give our speakers absolute freedom to you know express views. Uh, and we do this probably 15, 16 times uh, during the year. Okay. We also publish mm -hmm. uh, our pack nets and other commentaries. Okay. Never more than two pages because we understand right. no one in Washington. Short attention span. Short pages. attention. Yeah. Speaking of which, yeah. we're out of time, Ralph. Right. Uh, everybody go to the PAC Forum website, go to their events, go to the annual fundraiser. It's a, you'll, you'll meet very intelligent people there, I promise. Right. There are lots of those on the island as right. well. And I'll see you on Outside In next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Thank you very much. Aloha.